Awesome, we've got people joining now. Okay, so these numbers are coming in now, Frank. We're up to around uh, 40 people logging in. We know that some people log in as officers and watch it as a team. In fact, some people are telling me they use it as their, um, their sales meetings um or their their training meetings and um yeah so pretty pretty pumped and excited i've just uh, got up to speed about the great heather walton that we're going to be talking to over the next 45 50 minutes and firstly frank uh mate it's great to, to be back uh uh to absolute norm, norm, normality uh, um yeah i know that uh um so frank it was about 100 110 120 days wasn't it yeah, we were, we were in for a while. Wow. You, you, you would you would know because you ran every single day, Tom. I'm still okay. still impressed. I, I tell you, I can't. I, can't, I, I thought it was a two week lockdown. I remember the 26th. <laughs> you know, I with someone. I said, oh, I'm going to run the whole two weeks because I'm not. A, I, I don't run like you. You're a you're a fanatical <laughs> runner. And um, and then and then when I I I, I, I got it all wrong because she said it's going to finish in seven days. Yes, she said, you're really good. So I thought to myself, seven days most likely, 14 days the max. But in the end, we got that number wrong. And I was telling you, I couldn't wait till this lockdown finished, not for any other reason, but my legs were absolutely sore. <laughs> Someone just told me I had great hair and I'll take that because <laughs> we are a good couple of months in and I haven't seen a hairdresser for quite some time. So <laughs> it didn't happen easily. <laughs> yeah. I was like, thanks. Well, Thanks, Tom, for waiting until the middle of lockdown before you interviewed me on, you know, live <laughs> webinar with no Botox and no hairdresser in sight. Yes, <laughs> you look fantastic. Are you? In, are you? Um, uh, you're in Auckland, right? Yes. Yeah, so the two, my two franchise areas are both in Auckland. I'm pretty lucky actually, because one's sort of central Auckland, and the other is a beautiful beachside, sleepy little town about an hour away. So they're both in Auckland. Okay, so as we're uh, coming to you live right now, I've actually just finished a session with uh, with a Ray White office, Ray White Renuera, who's a client of mine, and um, we had a session there, and it's still unclear as to when uh, you're going to move from level three to, yeah, that's right. to the next level. Um, so, uh, Heather, how have you been coping with, uh, with the restrictions um, over the last month or two? To be honest, I actually love it. It consolidates everything that we believe in as a team, everything we do as a team. It's brought, you know, my office is very much like our family. Um, and that's one of the things that drove me to start my own office was actually wanting to create our own culture. And so, you know, we've pulled together very much as a team and really at the pointy end of the business. So we're no longer doing half hour open homes, but that half an hour with that client is so potent mm -hmm. that we're turning up and having these one-on-one um, -on -one viewings where a client's already been pre-qualified, we've already built rapport as much as we can on Zooms and things. We get them in and, and a lot of the times the team are actually making the sale right then and there. So yeah, yeah. we're loving it. Um, I don't want to be disrespectful to the challenges that this period poses for people, but I think that um, me and my management team and my husband have been really good at um, taking the positives out of this and really holding the hands of our salespeople along the way. Yeah. It's funny you say that, Heather, because we've come out of lockdown here in Sydney and a lot of my clients have reached out to me and they said, mate, just leave the auctions as they are. We're not going yep. on site at the moment. And I said, yeah, but look, you know, we're, we're out of the lockdown. They said, listen, the way it works in the diary, it fits in, it allows us to keep doing stuff. And many of them, Heather, are actually yep. saying they quite love what came out of the lockdown because you know what it's like you've got an open for inspection and you've got 70 80 people coming through the open it's like you're a salesperson at david jones and it's yeah. the boxing day sales and there are people flying and you're trying to work out who's who who's a potential vendor who's a vendor who's a buyer who's actually just lives next door and coming in you can't yeah. 
those conversations deep. They're all very superficial and they're very broad versus a narrowed conversation, as you say, that you can really have a deep connection with the client. So um, yeah. it sounds like it sounds like you know, whilst there are a few logistics issues of managing inspections, there are a lot of positives out of it and you've embraced those. Yeah, the team are acutely aware of um, an opportunity right now. The minute they've got an opportunity, they're doing something with it. They're not wasting an opportunity. Every single person they come across as a potential vendor, everyone's being treated with respect. And in lots of ways, we're actually operating the way that we should have been a very, you know, all along. So um, great learnings coming out of it. Great camaraderie within the team. The, we went into level four very, very quickly. It was a real shock to the country. And the following day, one of my colleagues, one of our elite uh, operators had a 14 person registered auction that she needed to kick off the next day. So we just ramped into top gear on how the hell we were gonna help her. Yeah. Um, we ended up with 12 people bidding at that auction, but 12 agents leapt to her side. Um, GFL in-house auctioneer set the whole thing up, Ella, our digital person, and the next day that, that auction was smashed out of the ballpark, you know, and the best part about it was the team didn't flinch, you know, the minute that we went in, the vendor was absolutely clear that they were in the best possible hands. Yeah, they were nervous. Um, maybe they didn't believe us, but my God, the result that we got for them was epic. So um, a lot of what I wanted to talk about today was about foundation building. And, you know, some of us are sitting in lockdown going, gee, because my principal hasn't done what what she's talking about and um, we've hardly spoken to our team we haven't seen anyone and that's probably the first question to anyone who's maybe wavering on what they're doing even in this industry at the moment is having a look at your foundation are you in the right place have you you know because we talk about it all the time with our business that we've created is having our management team is really our foundation and you can't you can't grow a tree unless you fertilize it. You can't build a house unless you've got good foundations. So that's kind of where it started all for me, right back at the beginning when I was selling in Remuera was, was getting those real foundations in place to move forward in a really strong way, if that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. So Tom, I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd love to hear a bit of this, the, the backstory as to um, as to how it all, all came about. And then we start, you know, talk, talking about this. And one comment I did want to make around that, that, that jumping in with the, the four, you know, the 11 agents helping in, I think that's a real credit yeah. to the, the culture that you've built, you know, the culture yeah. of collaboration. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to hear how that, you know, all, all started and, and start to unpack that with you if that's all right yeah totally I mean you know I'm always learning and that's I think if you think you've stopped learning it's probably time to hang up your open home flag but <laughs> um and that's what I love about the change to principle is you know I thought I sort of had it all sorted but you know one of my newest salespeople taught me something really valuable recently and I just I love that so you've got to be open to it as well that's so awesome. Yeah, God, what do you want to know? <laughs> well, where, where, when, when did you when did you get into real estate? So, were you was it correct prior you were um, you weren't always doing real estate, or you've done real estate from from the start? Um, so, I was in property law most of my life. I didn't get qualified as a lawyer because I'm a typical bullet a gate type person. I didn't have the patience for university, so instead of doing that, I went straight into a role in a law firm and built my way to the top where I would sit on partners meetings and things which was unheard of for a legal executive and a not unqualified lawyer um so that's you know I felt like I got to the top of in that situation um took a break went and lived in India in an ashram really? Really? <laughs> I think I did 1100 settlements in one day when I was at that law firm and I was shattered you know oh. very late 20s I was knackered so I did the went to India which was epic came back and tried to sort of get back into my old law firm ways and I, I'd sort of moved on from yeah. there. Um, and I actually ended up marrying a developer. So I went from property law into like property development, which was really cool because I got to use, I was basically in-house legal yeah. for, for our development company. So we built that from zero to about 150 million. Wow. And it super yachts and private butler, all that stuff. And one day um, woke up and realized that I wasn't 
that relationship wasn't serving me and walked away. Wow. Um, with nothing. So um, I love the fact that it wasn't the money that that I was kind of after, but I did realize that I loved the money. And so I had a look around and went, well, what can I do? I don't want to go back to law. Mm. Um, I was pretty broken financially, emotionally, physically, if you really want to know. And that's what the book's about. Yeah. Um, so one of my friends actually, I bid an auction for her. And I remember having this enormous Louis Vuitton handbag and it was like the battle shield. Yeah. And I went into this auction room and everyone looked at this chick and went, holy smoke, she's not going to stop. And I yeah. did, I didn't bid and bid. I was strong, powerful, and yeah. we won the auction. And she said to me, you need to do your real estate license. You're epic at this. Yes. Put me on the wrong side of the fence. But yeah. so I did my papers again. I'd actually done them the first time in 1995, many, many years ago when I was at the law firm, because one thing that we always used to think would be a great idea was to have an um, in-house agent for all our developers. Yes. Um, but that never really took off. I was too yeah. busy. Um, in fact, Ross Hawkins, our number one agent, was actually selling all the apartments at the time, and he now works with me. So that's really cool. We go back a long way. Um, and yeah, so then I um, I went into real estate thinking, um, you know, I was a bit of a fancy pants, so I'd go and work for a little boutique firm, yeah. and um, no naming any names or anything, but I learned how not to do real estate really quickly, Yes. Um, and also learned that it was how you, you just had to dig deep, sheer mm. grit and determination, um, and that's really what I look for in a new start salesperson now is, have you had some adversity? Have you had a few knocks? Um, I mean, it's hard because I wish that on nobody. But, you know, it, when you are needing to dig deep, and you do in this industry, you know, a lot of people think you roll into real estate and, and you can be amazing. It's easy money and you earn a commission and this and that really frustrates me because it's one of the hardest things I've done in my life. Yeah. Um, but you do, you've got to come back to those roots, those foundations. Why are you doing this? Mm. What are your values? And dig it in, you yeah. know, and 120 days straight with no break, 14 hour days. Wow. Wow. Sometimes you need that. Yeah. So that's kind of how it came about. Awesome. I, I'd love to just a couple of those things you said, the, the how not to do real estate. Like, what? give me one or two of those, what those what those might be. So, you know, for people you know, in inside listening who might be like, hey, that's that's something we're doing at the moment. We're something we can, you know, fix and change. I'd love to know, you know, give us maybe one or two of those what, those items. I should say I learned sort of a little bit about how to. The, the thing that was done really well was relationship building, and that yeah. still remains a key foundation for me as a business owner and as a salesperson, but it was um, it was pretty scary stuff, really. It was, um, you know, doing something you love, riding a horse and thinking, you've, you know, you've got an open home at one o'clock and just going, nah, let's not go. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kid you not. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. So, that culture didn't fit with mine, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah. Yeah. But also, um, without giving Ray White too much of a plug, because I know we're talking to the whole um, country here, but yeah. it was really, really fascinating going from a small business and plugging my stuff into a very big machine with mm. incredible um, digital stuff, really good um programs and things and first thing I did when I walked into Megan Jaffe's office all those years ago was say where's our system what do we do that's all I want to know what do we do and she taught me my desktop and off we went you know um, and I still to this day remain probably one of the strongest um, digital and most hands-on salespeople who can do anything I could turn up and be um, Ross Hawkins PA if I wanted tomorrow so I know everything and that's actually one of my keys to success too is knowing how to do everything yes from from a listing loading it in the system right through to selling it yes so just learn how and, and do you do you find so we have a question that's come in but I just I want to ask one question before mm -hmm. that do you find the reason you want to do that is so that you can do it or so that you at least know how so that you know if it's the, you know the best like what what is the reasoning behind why you want to know that end to end yeah. I think if you talk to any high performer um, they are utter control freaks yes. and unless you I know 
how or why I can't do a job properly. So it frustrates me that I have to rely on someone. If I want to do something, I have brainwaves in the middle of the night, 2 a.m. I get up. My poor husband's probably listening to this going, (laughs) I'll get up and I want to do it now. I don't want to wait till the morning, you know. Um, Poor PA David, he'll he'll be watching this too going, oh, Houston, we have a problem. (laughs) He'll be up in the morning and he's got 50 emails and he'll, will you sleep? (laughs) <laughs> so it's just wanting to do things with immediacy but also to make sure that we're doing it the right way and the best way possible so yes. it's, I've loved lockdown because Ella um, our training manager she's been doing so much stuff with the team and I've watched everything so I'm kind of providing the content she's providing the how and the team are just Lifting it, we won the real estate of origins for Ray White International um, appraisal drive recently. Oh, cool! So, I had this little little brain child in the middle of the night, which the team jumped on board, allowed the process, and I don't know how many uh, over 500 appraisals anyway. In one day, it sorry, in one day, yeah, wow, (laughs) I kid you not. Well, I big- generated 85 of my own. <laughs> how big is the team? That's incredible. Actually, let, let I want to spend a bit of time on that, Frank, because I actually think, it would, I mean, fundamentally, um, um, getting listings is the core objective of an age. It, listings solve every problem. In it. They, they solve a branding problem. They solve a cash problem. They just solve, you know, momentum, inquiry problem. Um, so that was, I think that was about three, four weeks ago, wasn't it, Heather? Or yeah, that's right. During, yeah. during the lockdown, right? And I reckon, listen, everyone that's watching this, I would suggest in your business, it is a it is a Ray White initiative that they seem to do, you know, uh, a few times a year. Um, every, I'd love I'd love to get some of the the, the learnings on um, mm. how it all works for you to share it with with the audience, because even if you're mm. a Ray White business, I actually think having these blitzes, if you like, are a wonderful way to get the team together to be singular focused on, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, getting on the phones and getting appointments or a worst case scenario, Heather, you know, having uh, contact with their, uh, with, with, their, with their appointments. And even if they don't get an appointment, they've actually got a touch point. So how long does it go for and um, how does it all work? So they run it from, we went from one o'clock in the afternoon till five o'clock. So I think it was four hours. And I mean, we don't get me wrong. We had a plan. We had an absolute strategy and we jumped online at one o'clock and Macca goes, you know, let's go. And I went, we're going to win this. (laughs) (laughs) And he said to me, you called it. And it's because we had a strategy. Um, We sent out a, um, an engagement letter, if you like, to our databases, which it's probably about 80,000 in it, if not more. Um, and it was such a well-written thing. And I don't know that I'll share it online because um, it was really our intellectual property that we created, but it was so such a well-worded subject heading that it absolutely grabbed people. And we studied this big time later going, why is it out of every email we've ever done in the history of the universe is this one hit the mark? And not only did they reply, but they replied within hours. Yeah, that right. night, when we sent the email out, that night I had agents just about crying, going, how am I going to keep up with this? I was nearly <laughs> crying. I had 85. Yeah. So we quickly streamlined a strategy, which was reply instantly, so they know we've got it. Um, and then we had all the precedent responses to go back. And then we managed to mop the whole lot up, which was desktop appraisals by that Friday. But the whole idea of the drive was, is that, and the rules of engagement were that you had to enter the appraisal within the hours of one and five o'clock. So there would have been a little bit of backlogging and holding back, you know, we're really so, so, so here, uh, just from, from what you just said there regarding the email, so it wasn't just phone. Yep. Call, it wasn't just phone calls. It was also any form of any form of communication um, to yep. create that, to create a virtual appraisal. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so the time. I think. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Well, I think the timing was perfect as well. So we had a we had a um, a key thing that we, a key message we were coming across, and it hit people in the middle of lockdown, in the middle of boredom, in the middle of 
Kiwis love rugby and property. That's what we do. That's it. Um, and it just generated um, a massive response. Um, okay. and, I'm, and I'm very mindful of, of, of not sharing uh, the intellectual. Yeah. Property, right. But but I will look because I know we've wet people's taste buds. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what I will do is I'll share an email um, and Heather, I just can't get over the simplicity of this email and the results that it's been getting. Yeah. I had a client, mm -hmm. all they did is in the subject box, Frank, all mm -hmm. they did is in the subject box. So no logos, nothing too salesy. You know the feeling when you get an email that looks like a graphic design has been yeah. attached to it, so automatic you think, oh, I'm being sold. So yeah. this email was a very clean blank email so those that are watching here i'd love you to try it in the subject box you just write the words are you thinking of selling during this real estate frenzy in the subject box no words yeah. or nothing else it's sent out you'll be shocked oh no no words in the body so that's it just there just the head and it's not to come it's not to come out of you know mailchimp or yeah, one of those yeah. you want them to be able to reply back to the email the authenticity yeah, yeah. and um, i'm just shocked at how many agents tell me people uh -huh. actually reply back on the run wasn't thinking of it what do you reckon my place is worth or or this and that you yeah know? But if you go back to that silly old thing that people used to do back in the day, which was write on a business card, call me please between five and six this evening. I mean, I mean I've personally never done that. But when you, as a, I remember owning a house and getting a card and thinking, oh, do they have a buyer? It just yeah. engages them. And it's simple. We overthink all the stuff. Mm. And, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel either. That's the other thing. You just have to put your own spin on it so that it's authentic. Raylan is asking, how would you, so we're just getting questions as we're going along. How would a typical day look like for you, Heather? Um, do you oh, have a routine? I certainly do. So the morning part of it's easy. So the alarm goes off and I meditate. Um, and that's with my husband. We're doing an Indian chanting mantra at the moment, which is driving me crazy because I can't get out of my head. <laughs> and then we um, start with our gratitude journals. Um, write down what we're grateful for the day and during level four I would then start my daily um, contact with my team which was writing up some daily stuff just to get their days going my day is more broken into my week so this is what happens on a Monday which is generally call back follow up from the weekend um, we promise our vendor reports are always gone by Tuesday night so any rats and mice is Tuesday gone by Tuesday night Wednesdays, appraisals, um, presentations, appointments, Thursday, Friday, we try to have a day off. And this is when real estate's operating in a normal way mm. because Friday, the admin just need a minute. They actually just need to catch up to all their open homes and take a day off for God's sake. Yeah. And then, um, you know, obviously Saturday, Sunday, open homes. It's very different in lockdown. Um, but all I have to say is there's no downtime. You know, I've got... So after I've done my meditation, gratitude, kick-started a couple of emails, I go and exercise mm -hmm. um, and then get back and start the day. So okay. those okay. are non-negotiable. I love that. What, what, time, what time does the day start? Like uh, what time in the morning? Well, I'm a big believer in the 5 a.m. club. I love that stuff. If anyone yeah. hasn't read the 5 a.m. club, um, yeah. I'm a big audio book girl because I travel between Auckland and Omaha, so I get two hours to listen to stuff. Yeah, awesome. It's such a cool story. Um, yeah. I've been a bit lazy in lockdown, but back home in Auckland, we have hit bikes upstairs where we look at Rangitoto, and um, we get up there and... You're supposed to, if anyone knows about 5am club, it's a 20-20-20 thing where you exercise for 20, meditate for 20 and learn for 20. So you have an hour before the rest of the world gets up um, and it changes your world. Honestly, I think, um, I know a couple of agents that do it. Yeah. That's the awesome. guy that wrote the book has 5am club on his private jet. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, oh, me God. Yeah, I'm so, 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 so Heather... Um, I love having females on in real estate interviews because I think what it does is it, it is it creates it creates a model of possibility 
to a lot of the girls because and, and we do get a yep. lot of times we get a lot of people saying oh you know too many guys too many guys but then on other occasions you know we actually find it really hard to get females that are good at real estate but also to articulate it because sometimes they're two different things one thing is doing the job and another thing is being able to sort of sit back and say articulate it this is what I do this is how I think this is how it all came about right so it's so good having you here I'd love you to sort of share you know what like and, and you've got you've said to me off camera when we we're talking with Frank before that you've one of your, your your great achievements you feel is not just in yourself but in people that are in your team I think you said rising yeah. stars or something along the lines of that um have you been able to see the qualities and attitudes, behaviours of people that really crack it in real estate, you know, um, to yep. share it with us? You know, the, the, the do's and the don'ts. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if it's do's and don'ts, but the people... Um, so when I went into real estate myself, I, I won Rookie of the Year, which, you know, we actually call it um, New Start Salesperson at Ray White, but for all intents and purposes, it's Rookie of the Year. Um, so, which is the most amount of gross commission that anyone earns in their first year of real estate from about 1,700 agents, just to put that into perspective. Wow. So, um, when I went to business ownership, um, I mean, I guess my the thing that I had most to offer to people that came into real estate was getting them started because I was such a prolific lister that I found that I could just sort of put somebody on a listing for a couple, maybe two or three months, and if they had what it took, they'd take off. I learned really quickly what sort of attributes to look for in people that it would work and what it didn't work. And I come back to this thing about foundations and where you come from, your core values and what drives you. So if you ask yourself, why am I doing real estate? And your answer is, eh, it's a bit of fun. Um, quite like houses, like interior design. It's quite stereotypical of me to say, but chances are you won't make it. Um, if you go into it like one of my guys did, who he was about to crack it big. He was in a um, online um, business, if you could say, he was about to make millions. Mm. The rug was ripped out from under him and he lost everything. Um, for that guy um, to come to me broken and say, you know, I, I I don't even know what to do. I've got this little family um, to go from thinking my life looked like that to um, I'm yours. Just mm -hmm. I'll do everything you say. He connected himself to me. His desk was literally connected to me. We were connected at the hip for probably about a year. And he dug it in like I've never seen anyone dig it in before. And sure enough, new start salesperson, elite, chairman elite, he's off. Um, another person, um, I won't go too much into their detail because it's quite private, but um, same thing, massive adversity in his life, um, was getting older in life, wasn't a young person, um, and he just didn't have time on his side, so the urgency was there, um, the adversity had been there, um, and he's got some really deep reasons for doing well. Um, but I have had people that I've been really disappointed with. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I, I am probably one of the kindest people that you'll ever meet. I'm probably one of the most generous people to a fault, um, even though I like people who criticise me or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's just you can't give that to somebody. You can't learn it. Mm -hmm. um, you've either got it or you haven't, really. Yeah. So, so Frank, it's really interesting. I just can't, you know, I just can't help it. 34 years in this business mm -hmm. and just looking at the girls or guys, I look at the girls yeah. or guys that do 100 sales, 200 sales, 300 sales, right? Tes Tesla, for an example, is at 270, 272 sales for the year. He's got 28 to go to do 300. But they don't have high IQs necessarily. I don't even think that they actually look like models. I don't actually think to myself they've got the perfect education, but I think, Heather, a lot of them have one of the following, a broken heart, an empty wallet, or a hungry stomach, right? The, the combination of those threes makes someone want to do it badly. But then, okay. Yeah, but then again, occasionally, you find a person that has had those things and they make the decision that, 
I've had bad luck in my life. I'm a victim. It's not my fault. There's nothing I can do about it. So having those things yeah. doesn't guarantee that the Correct. adversity is going to be a trampoline because there still requires a person to say, hey, I'm going to be the person that's going to stop this cycle in my life. I'm going to, you know, accept that this is the events I've been faced and the decisions I take are going to make things better or worse. I'm going to choose better decisions, you know. Yeah, so that's when you start to need to meditate, listen to books. I'm reading one at the moment by Ant Middleton called Zero Negativity, and it's just, that's all it is. I mean, and talking about my foundations and goals again, it's like every time you pick up the phone, don't just pick up the phone and be random, like, oh, I'm going to ring this person. I wonder how that's going to go. No, -uh. have a call plan. What's the end game? You know, like this guy that came into real estate said to me, Heather, I want to do what you do. I want to earn 2 million gross commission every year. And he does, you know. And do you know, there are a million different public speakers that will stand up in front of you and talk to thousands of people and say that the one thing you need to do to be successful is write goals. You know, how many people do? Maybe 5%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that easy. Yeah. Uh, how how are your goals like broken up? Do you is it the long term and then you break it right down to like it down to individual weeks? Like I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, well, that's part of the daily thing. So with my journal, it's um if today was gonna to be an epic day, what would happen? Which yes. is another way of writing um a goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. gratitude for stuff that happened yesterday and yeah. um affirmations of how to get there so I'm constantly you know positive reinforcing yes. um, so then you've got your spiritual financial physical um, fin you know goals of what you want to achieve and I love this guy I go back to when I you know I've, I did meet my husband who's my absolute soulmate back right back when we began we started with a foundation of zero like he'd left his marriage, I'd left mine, not for each other. I'll just clear that up. Yep. Um, found each other and we we started our dream boards and we used to have them digitally as a screen on our computer and we just tick things off and tick things off and tick. And next you you manifest at yeah. phenomenal rates. And now we just, you know, we have waterfront houses and all the places that we want to be. We drive amazing cars. Um you know, we live in the dream, really, and we're surrounded ourselves by people that we love and inspire them to do the same. I love that. What what, what drives you these days? So you, you know, you, you you hit those helping goals other forward. people. Yeah, yeah. Is it is it helping yeah. help, helping the team in the businesses? Yeah, I don't um, like my husband. Poor old thing. He's trying to figure out what to buy me for my fiftieth this year, and I just keep saying to him, "There's actually nothing financial that I could." possibly want but our decision making process is pretty simple does it serve our family which is our work family or our home family yes yeah. no decision made move on so mm -hmm. it, it's all that's important to us we're grandparents now which is super yeah. exciting yeah um, but it's my motto is quality not quantity it always has been in my real estate world I don't sell thousands of houses a year 50 at the most but for very very high value mm -hmm. um yeah, and just, you know, we're not bums on seats. Everyone who works in yeah. the black group um, is personally interviewed, selected, yeah. chosen as someone we want to have in our culture who mm. fits with our culture. We tend to find they self-eject pretty quickly if they don't fit the culture. Yes, yes. Um, but, yeah, just very yeah. excited. What, what does a culture look like in the business? Is it like a culture of high performance or is it like what, what, what's, the, what's the mix of, of, of key attributes? <sighs> Your core values that make up the culture of your different offices? I think it comes down to the personal profiling of the business owners, which is me, who's a hard ass, driven, <laughs> bloody, don't cut any corners. Yes. Um, you know, I'm just a taskmaster and a half. And then yeah. there's my beautiful husband, who's a very kind, warm soul. So we are polar opposites. Um, and the management team are amazing. You know, they, they really are the pinnacle and the cornerstone of our business and everyone's got very different attributes yes yes um, but the culture is really sharing caring if we have a situation or a scrap over commission I'm not a you know like it just doesn't happen in our business yes. as soon as somebody hits some friction mm -hmm. they're like right how do we resolve this how do we make this okay for everybody let's work this out there's something in it for everyone um, no one wants to fall out it's really that, good love that that's so good now now 
Sorry, oh, Frank, Frank, there's three three things that I'd love to get uh, before we uh, uh, finish up today. That uh, I, I want to find a little bit about so uh, on your vendor paid advertise, like you you, you, yes. looking, you won an award um, for yep. New Zealand for the most VPA in the in, in the Herald, and I'm obsessed with VPA ever because I come from the media. I came from uh, News Corporation, and and I've always been intrigued. Why is it that some agents are very mm -hmm. marketing based? You know, they become like, you know, rock stars, brand ambassadors. They, they have this attraction about them. And I know that vendor paid advertising is part of it. I also want to ask you, maybe I'll ask you first. So you wrote a book. What's the name of the book? It's called Rags to Riches to the Real Me. Okay. When did you write it? Uh, it took about three months, but it's been written in my head for about the last 20 years. Right. So when, when, is, is it out now? It's in its final stage of edit, um, right. and now I've just got to choose a publisher. But right. my editor is pretty excited. Right. Okay. And 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 and, and to, in essence, that what's what's if you had to turn if someone if someone sat with you and you had to describe in one minute um, what's the book about, what would you say? It's about it's a story. It's a memoir with a self help. So it, it does tell my story. So it's a little bit self serving in that regard. But at the end of every chapter is a um, rags to riches tips, um, or an inspo action of what you can do to implement that into your own life, or to look back over how that lesson in my life could help you with yours. Beautiful. In a nutshell. Well, we look forward to it. Now, on the vendor paid advertising front, what? why do you think you won that award as the most VPA a couple of years ago? Um, and apparently you think that no one's actually broken the volume of, of the amount of marketing that you've done. I'm just curious, why do you think that some agents are good at the, at the VPA and others struggle with it? Because I think people are scared of money. Like when I went into this and, you know, I came from a really wealthy situation and it was a self-made situation. So nothing was ever given to me, but I was very good at spending money. So I failed to understand how you could sell your biggest asset without investing in that outcome. And I failed to see why you would want me investing in that so that I'm invested in its outcome. So mm -hmm. why am I going to pay your marketing? Do you really want me to tell you to sell it for less because, you know, I want my money back? So, uh, and I just think um, you've got to believe to achieve. So if you can just be really convincing about your belief about it, like why aren't they believing that they need big budgets? Why aren't you? You know, this is these people's biggest asset. What, and they want you to pay for the marketing or they're not going to contribute? What, they think you can sell a secret? It's actually ludicrous, like ludicrous. So when you put it that way, they're actually too scared not to spend marketing money, you know? Like some of my budgets were eighteen to twenty thousand dollars, and that was when print media was was everything. And I was also really driven with my own profile. So, um, best way to profile yourself is profile a property, right? Mm. How, how how would a, a young girl or guy that's watching this? And and you know, let's be very clear: most of the people that are consuming content in training in real estate fundamentally they want to list and sell more mm. real estate, right? That's, yep. That's what they want to do. They want to list mm -hmm. it more, and and hopefully they can, you know, get down the path that you've gone and and build a build a build a life that you know is um, is fun and enjoyable and lucrative. Mm -hmm. um, what what would you say are ways that an agent now can actually build their personal brand? Mm -hmm. Because you said that print's not mm -hmm. where it used to be. Well, yeah, I didn't say that in too many words because I don't want to offend any of my beautiful partners that support me and still do very much including print media um how what would i say to them well first i'd say to them make yourself indispensable as a sales associate to some of the top people in real estate that would be who i'd sell that's the first thing i'd sell i'd sell myself mm -hmm. to someone in your office or someone that you know that um, get on their coattails. And those are the words I used with one of my new starts was get on my coattails, hold on, and it'll be a ride. And that's what he did. And when I kicked him off my coattails, he flew. So 
um, the best way to promote yourself is to have a listing. And I know how desperately difficult that is to get. So, I mean, we could do another three hour session on prospecting and how to get listings. But in short, I mean, the, you know, I poo poo the boutique agency I went to work for, but in that person's defense, what I took from it was I had access to people, you know, and I had access to listings and I just made the most of it. So you can't start from nothing. Mm. So people who are young. So the other thing too is networks. You know, I came into real estate when I was in my mid to late thirties. So I had networks, I had legal networks, property development networks, lawyers. I had so many different avenues I could get listings from and they were all relationships. Whereas a young person comes into this industry, what have they got? You know, they need to upskill, be amazing at some part of it that these top performers are not amazing at. Because you can't do everything. I'm telling you now, if you're doing 2 million gross commission, you ain't doing it all yourself. Mm -hmm. So my best advice would be to be one of those people that that, um, those people need. Does that make sense? It makes makes 100% sense. I mean, Matty Steinway from McGrath's at Terrigal who's, I think he's been McGrath's number one for, you know, quite many, many years, right? He writes about 5 million fees. He said to me, you know, if I was a young Matt Steinway competing against Matt Steinway, what I would do to me is the things that I don't do or don't like doing now. And I said, give me an example of that. He goes, well, you know, if if I can tell that someone's going to be a long time coming on the market and they're just sort of sussing things out, I don't have the time that I used to service that person. So if there's a young person, they would go out there, they would spend time, or another thing is with buyers, Heather. You just Mm. spend so much more time with a buyer than say a two or three million dollar agent who's always looking at, hey, is this guy listing now or is he or is he, or is he listing in six months? Because I want to concentrate on my 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 today people. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. opportunity is that oh. one thing, one thing that a one thing that a million dollar agent doesn't have is the time they used to Correct. have. You know, and you're absolutely right. So if you're, you know, you're a young and you're new to the industry, you've got nothing to do, but you actually get in the door and you're up against the best in the suburb or whatever, just, you just have to say, mate, I have got all the time in the world for you. That guy doesn't. Mm-hmm. And we're in such an industry in a digital space mm-hmm. where um, you, the buyers will find you. We're not conjuncting too much anymore because our buyer demand is so full on. Mm-hmm. Even the buyer's agents know there's no point in ringing that agent because the buyers will have already found it. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got your campaign done on campaign track. If that, you know, if Facebook and all the other things don't find them, they will bloody find it. So I always say to my team, just blitz that top agent because if they think they're getting that agent, they're not going to. They'll get one of his underlings. They're better to have you. But, mm-hmm. of course, I switch that conversation when it suits me. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And, 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 look, to everyone that's watching, because I know we often get a very large section of the audience that are people that aren't at the $1 million mark. Yep. And one of them had that said to me the other day, he goes, I'm, I'm up against an agent that goes in. He's got total dominance. He sells most of the properties. He's got attraction, very hard to beat. And I said, why? And he goes, oh, well, he goes in and he says, well, we sell the most homes. And I said, well, you're just going to change it. You're going to say, we don't sell the most homes, but we sell the homes for most. You (laughs) You work your unique strength. No, we don't sell the most homes. We actually only concentrate on three or four properties, but we sell those for the most. Can I ask you, Mr. and Mrs. Vendor, are you looking for an agent that sells the most homes or the agent that will sell your home for the most? Yeah, exactly. And I've proven that again in this new franchise area up here in Omaha, which um, it's a really tiny little town. There's only probably 2,000 homes in it. Um, And there's been two agents that have dominated this space for many, many years. And we've been in here less, probably six months, really. And now we're the go-to. We've sold the last three waterfront properties for over 7 million that are here. So it can be done, you know. I love that. We have two, 
Two, oh, sorry, you guys. We, no, have two no, questions. we just have two questions I didn't want to um, let the people miss out on before we close yeah. out. Uh, so one's from Porsche asking, we'd love to know Heather's thoughts on the relevance of the pay later funding solutions for listing expenses like vendor marketing and preparing your home for market. So yeah, absolutely. You know, um, back when I started and I did, you know, not wasn't always amazing at selling BPA, but when I started, there was a thing called real estate funders that did that. And it's mm -hmm. absolutely... It, it is definitely a thing because there's one sure thing in this Auckland market or wherever you are in New Zealand that will sell. Yes. Um, so definitely push that, you mm. know. Why, yeah, 100% support that. I think that's a fantastic way to get it paid, you know. Frank, right. I think fundamentally that has been one of the big, the big prop tech tools. And I mean, you know, VPA campaign agent is one of them. That's one that I, you know, I like and we, we know Seth Watts there, but there are plenty of others there. I think to the writer of this, I think it's Penilla. Sorry, it's not Penilla. I'm not quite sure. Let me just say okay, it. Okay, Porsche. Porsche. Yeah. Okay, nice name. Um, to, 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 to Porsche there, anything that takes away friction or a barrier to yeah. energy is a good thing. And, you know, Absolutely. Jerry Harvey has proven that. Harvey Norman have basically proven a business model is by now nothing to pay um, yes. till later. They've been able they've been able to do it. And, um, and I know I can tell you a lot of real estate agents now basically turn around and say to a vendor at a listing presentation, Mr. and Mrs. Bedford, can I just ask you, would you like to pay now? Would you like to pay later? A lot yeah. of them say, pay yeah. later. This is the path. It's as simple as this. Yeah, yeah, love that. So one of the things I wanted to say today was um, for anyone new or, or even that's old or whatever, but um, it's not all about you, you know, like don't forget that our biggest stumbling block is the most, we charge a fortune. So it, it's it's pretty average just to turn up and expect you to get the listing and, and, and that's kind of it. Like office, offer stuff, you know, and if, if you go offering, look, if, if the marketing money is a struggle for you, I've got some, op I've got some options for you. There's this company, this company, this company, yeah. um, you know, because I'm the boss, I can actually pay it and take it off my commission. There's so many different ways where I can talk to my boss about that. Um, but, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve you, you know, so many people in this industry have the wrong attitude you know it's not about you it's about your clients and mm. um if you have that attitude the whole way through you will get referral business because you know they'll they'll have nothing but good things to say about you like today i've got i'm moving heaven and earth to get beautiful flowers brought up here to this eight million dollar listing mm. i've emailed the client this morning saying i noticed there's a bit of crap blown inside i'm going to vacuum i've got my spray in white and it's just at anything. And my husband is one of the best real estate trainers you'll ever come across. And he's always saying to me things like, when you have a listing that didn't sell, when he was in the car industry, he would get his sales people to go, there's a bloody R8 in the back of the yard, go and get it, park it in the front and clean it. So he'd get the sales guys out the front, parks this R8 in there that's yellow and nobody wants. Yeah, yeah. And he starts loving it, starts yeah, giving yeah. it love, neck minute, sold. <laughs> so, you know, we go down these negative trails. It's like, oh, I've got the shitty listing and the vendor's an asshole and it's overpriced and rah, rah. Give it some love. Give it some positivity. You know, whether that's the client, whether it's the house, just give it some love, you know. And it's like a part of your body when you've got a sore back. All you do is walk around going, ah, oh, my bloody back, my bloody, your poor back. I just want some love. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's, you know, you see it'll happen all the time where a property has been on the market with an agent for uh, three months. Yeah. Uh, a new agent comes along and sells a property in the first two weeks and it's the same property and often Correct. in a repositioning of price. What there has been is a reposition of energy. And I and I and I do understand if you've had a property on the market for three months, you can actually get into that, you know, emotional sort of state where you actually lose belief in it yourself. Yeah. You lose but, belief in it. So but yeah. Tom, here's a really fun thing I love to do. So when I've lost lost my will to live on a listing, I call a meeting with the vendors and come in and go, right, I think it's time we sack the agent. Let's get rid of her. She's done bloody useless job, right? Okay. 
Heather, you're gone. Right, now I'd like you to meet Heather. Hi, how's it going? What a beautiful house. Tell me what went wrong with the last agent yeah. and just start again. It's so much fun because they love you. It's not you that's been the problem, right? It's just everyone needs a reset and then you go again. So just because you haven't sold something in the agency, put a bloody great big fat AIM campaign on it and away you go, you know, plug for AIM. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's exactly what I do. Yeah. Exactly what I do. Yeah, and for everybody's knowledge who, who may not know what that's about, so that's our social and digital product to, to mm. put it across all of the Google Display Network and all of Facebook and Instagram mm. and, and attract all of the, the passive buyers that may not be looking on the, you know, the traditional portals. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, well, so, so, so Heather, it, yeah. appears, it appears that apart from print, you are a, an agent that um, uses a lot of the new technology tools to, to try and find the, the, the best buyer, not necessarily the easiest buyer or the first buyer, but the best yeah. buyer. Um, in a typical marketing campaign, yeah. um, what will you include print, social media, uh, uh, as paid social, social media? So I tried an experiment a few years ago. I think it was after I won the country. I felt like it was cool. It's like I ticked that box and I'm going to try all sorts of stuff. So I actually went down a route of no print media for a while. And what happened was I was still selling houses, but I felt like my profile really, really dropped um, from a vendors looking for you type of thing. So in lots of ways, I feel like you can do without print. Um, unless I am a firm believer in a really exceptional property that someone would sell their house for, for example, if it had a massive view, most people get sick of looking for properties with views because they don't come up very often, but when they do, they would go and look at it. So they don't have active searches saved on trade me and things. They don't get the alerts of those listings, but those are the ones where I put a big feature in the Herald, you know, because of the 360,000 readership or whatever. It's because you want to reach the passive readers for those type of properties yes. old people that demographic they still pick up print um so it just you really got to look at it but also again coming back to it's not all about you it's about being really certain about how you feel about that marketing and is it appropriate for that particular listing you know like mm -hmm. i wouldn't put massive print media for an apartment in town somewhere that's you know that no one looks for them there they're all online with trade me and real estate and things um yeah, so, but yes, I use everything. So what happened when I, the New Zealand Herald, when they, when I stopped using them for a year to see what would happen, um, I just said to them, well, what's your digital answer to this? And it was one roof. So off we went. The biggest and baddest ass one roof campaigns we could do. Um, and we just went, went to town on everything. So we are the top package for Trade Me, the top package for AIM. I do the top of everything in my campaigns yeah just well, it's it's fascinating you know during this lockdown period frank i was uh, I'd, I'd walk the bay run with uh people i'd have meetings my yeah. meetings were walking because you couldn't get into trouble for exercise yeah. right so you'd walk and what was fa interesting you know a lot of the people that i walked with are people that are pretty you know heavy hitters in real estate they you know own you know lots of property and developers and that and I would send them links on properties yeah. and, um, you know, I'd send them, you know, stuff by Instagram versus Facebook. And I noticed they'd say, oh, mate, can you send me, can you send me a, another link or can you send me a photo of it? And it became very clear to me, there's a demographic of people, probably 50 and oh. over, who have got a lot of money, who invest in real estate, who make decisions about real estate. And they're not on TikTok or Snapchat, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those apps right these people here are still using what i consider to be traditional media right and yeah. uh, and and, the, and they are people that are in the passive window right so they're not necessarily sitting on a realestate.com or trade me every minute of the day you know they're busy successful yeah. but listen i've had a it, this has been a wonderful chat a wonderful chat with one of the great agents Heather mm -hmm. ray white in uh, in new zealand in level three and uh, hopefully level two, or mm -hmm. all of this will be over by, by Christmas time, I'm pretty certain, or shortly afterwards. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. look, girl or guy there, 
I hope that, you know, look, Heather earns more than Jacinta Rardin, right? You, you got to, everyone's got to understand you. Oh. A real person. This is a serious business, friend. We, we, we have people here that are making two and three times what Scott Morrison makes, right? <laughs> but the tone of this conversation is that, hey, listen, you know, drop your bullshit excuse, have a reality check, get serious, go pro. And mm. fundamentally, I think what I'm yeah. hearing Heather, is get super clear as to the reasons why you are doing this business and ask yourself, yep. are you interested in it or are you committed? Are you all in or have you got a plan B, which is if this doesn't work out, I'll go back to doing something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand over to you for your final. And look, that's fine. Look, and that's fine for them, Tom. I think it's all about... Um, why the whys of why you're doing it where you want to go like the goal of what you want to do and you may not want to win the country or something that's fine too but as long as you're on track to do it mm -hmm. um and then really it's quite as simple as just making sure you're in the right place to do it and putting those structures of your day and things in place to get there but gratitude um you know, being kind to other people, making sure you're true to your values and your family values and things. If you're in a toxic environment, move yourself and be positive. Um, sounds all very eerie fairy, but I think I'm allowed to own that after what I've been through. So if you want to know a bit more about me, read my book when it comes yes. out, might give you some understanding about that. Yes. And then we're launching the Heather Walton Academy later in the year. Um, probably early next year now, but yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah. But well, yeah, I love this and I just wish everyone so much success in whatever it is you want to achieve. Thank you for listening. Thank um, you. Feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. We really appreciate your time. And when your book comes out, let us know so we can share it out uh, to the database and let everybody know. And, and thank you everybody for joining today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, bye.